It was, yeah, but it'll be a great time, so please come up. And Denny, where is Denny? She wanted to come and share a bit of a testimony before we start. Hello, everybody. Isn't it beautiful out there? Isn't God awesome in his creation? Just blows my mind. Anyway, I'm here to share my testimony with you. Two weeks ago, I went through a profound experience with Ken and the Deliverance Ministry, and it's changed my life completely. As some of you know, I have suffered from anxiety most of my life, but it had become increasingly crippling in the last few years, and I found I was unable to do anything I wanted to do. And so, anyway, the anxiety is gone, totally gone. I no longer have to take medication for it, and it has left me free. And also, oh, thank you, thank you. Praise God, all the glory is God's. And um, I also was able to conquer an addiction I've had since 1985. And also, I was suffering from PTSD from living in intolerable, intolerable conditions where I was living for 14 years. And that's gone too now. Praise God, praise God. It's totally changed my life. I see everything differently now. It has brought me closer to God. I am now in true relationship with him. He is no longer just up there, but he's in here. And I can't express to you the freedom I feel and it's changed the way I look at everything. It's changed the way I look at prayer. I pray all the time now, whether it's in my designated prayer time that I set aside or just throughout the day. I just, it's like Paul said, pray ceaselessly. And that's what I do now. It's changed the way I look at worship and praise. I praise God all the time now for the major things and for every little thing. I ask him to make me aware so that I can praise him. It's changed the way I look at Holy Scripture. It's like I'm reading it with whole new eyes and new understanding. It's amazing what's in that book. It just blows my mind. And it's changed the way I look at faith. Faith is deep. And and I know the meaning of surrender. I have totally surrendered my life to God. And I ask the Holy Spirit to do his thing with me and lead me to where he wants me to be. And I'm excited to know what that is. And I pray that I have the courage and strength to carry out his will because I want to do that more than anything. Um, I now know what it's like to live each day in the joy of Jesus. Praise God, hallelujah. Say it with me, say it with me. Hallelujah, say it again, hallelujah. Amen, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can give the dismissal now. <laughs> Thank you, Denny. Jesus has come that you may have life and have it to the fullest. Hey, amen? amen. And he is faithful to us. Yeah. Even when we go a lifetime of knowing Jesus, there's still more. And his love, you know, has a way of working deeper into us. And sometimes we're finally at the stage, okay, Jesus, I'm ready to surrender more to you. Yeah.
Thank you, Denny. Thanks for that gift. Uh, my name is Pastor Dean Rostad. I'm the president at the Canadian Lutheran Bible Institute just down the road. And I'm honored to be here with you this morning, uh, leading your service, bringing the word and uh, bringing communion. Uh, Grace Lutheran has a, had a wonderful historic relationship with CLBI over the years. And I always like to do this when I'm in congregations. We can re be reminded of some of our history. What year did Grace Lutheran start? 1920, 28, 27? Wow. CLBI started in 1932. But was Grace Lutheran, were they always here? Yes, but it was the building down the Ukraine church. The Ukraine now, the Ukraine church is, yeah. Originally there? No, no, no. No. Oh, that building was here. Oh, my goodness. I love the history. So that building was here. It moved over there. And then, and then this new one, 1954. And there's been about three congregations in that. Oh my goodness. You guys have been a recycling congregation for years. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I love the history, the history of the Lord. Uh, please rise. Take a breath. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take a moment. Let us confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together, you servants of God. Please remain standing.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, upon your Bible, that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Is this it? Is this where the contest is? Fuck, 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 is this it? I don't know. Is this where the contest is? You... Hi. Hey, chicken. Hi. Do you know if this is where the contest is? No, I, I don't. You'd think they'd put up a sign or something. <laughs> right place. Although I don't even know why we are having a contest, everyone knows that bunnies go with Easter. No offense, but Easter chicken doesn't have the same ring to it. Aww. Well, what about the lizard? Who ever heard of an Easter lizard? Hey, chicken. Hey, bunny. Hi. Hey, lizard. I heard about this contest, so I figured I'd come check it out. No offense, Lizard, but why do you think you are the best animal to represent Easter? Because I'm the one you would least expect. Jesus was an unexpected king. He was God's son, and he was born in a stable. He lived for 33 years, and he preached peace and forgiveness when the Jews wanted a war. And if that's not unexpected enough, then the fact that he died for our sins. Who would expect that? A lizard is a perfect symbol of Easter just because nobody would expect it. Bunny, how, how did you get to be a symbol of Easter? And who would, what do bunnies have to do with that? I only know what my mother told me. She said that we were given the job by people so long ago and that no one is sure why we got it. But it might be because we live in burrows, which are like the cave that Jesus was buried in. It could be because we came out in the spring, which is the same time that Jesus was resurrected. Or maybe it's because bunnies make lots of little bunnies. So we are symbols of new life, like the new life Christ brings. Oh, I'm not even sure I should be in this contest then. I mean, I, I just, uh, I just answered it because I lay eggs and I thought that would be something special. Oh, but what would Easter be without Easter eggs? There wouldn't be the Easter egg hunt or the Easter dying of our eggs or our Easter rolling. Oh. Or chocolate oh. eggs. I Ooh. love chocolate Ooh, eggs. Yeah. The little hollow ones, oh. the peanut butter ones, uh -huh. the crispy oh, rice yes. ones. Yes. Okay, <sighs> we, we get it. You like the chocolate eggs. <laughs> Ooh, the cream filled ones, <laughs> the Cadbury ones, <laughs> the white chocolate ones. Oh, and the ones with caramel. caramel. I really love the ones with caramel. But eggs don't exactly have anything to do with Easter. I think you're I think you're wrong. Eggs have a hard shell. Mm -hmm. It's just like the sealed tomb that Christ was placed in. And when you crack them open, it's like you've opened the tomb up. 
So we can see that Christ was resurrected. Oh, oh, hey, I just thought of something. Eggs have three parts. They have a shell and the yolk and the white. That's just like God the Father and God the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh. Truthfully, any one of us could, would make a great Easter animal. Don't you guys think? Yeah. I wonder how they will choose. I don't know how they'll choose. Oh, 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 huh? oh, 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 only those willing to sacrifice their lives may apply. Uh-oh. Uh, what does uh, sacrifice mean? Um, I, I don't know, but I'll look it up, okay? I'll look it up, okay. Mm, um, let's see, uh, the act of slaughtering an animal or person or surrendering a possession as an offering to God. Uh, 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 doesn't slaughter mean to kill? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe it's because Jesus died on the cross. Yes, and he died in place of the lamb that used to be killed on the altar to ask God's forgiveness. I, I, I just remembered. The kids are expecting us home to play hide and seek. See y'all later. Uh, okay. uh, bye. 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 Uh, 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 oh my goodness. Uh, oh no. I, I feel an egg coming on. I better go. Bye. <laughs> I'm somewhat feeling that a lizard is a little bit too unexpected for Easter to be a sacrifice. So it's been fun. Bye. It doesn't look like any animals showed up to represent Easter. It's a shame because the, the pay was Easter eggs. Uh, <clears throat> I, got, I got the signs. Oh, I left out a word. <clears throat> only those willing to sacrifice life was supposed to be only those willing to sacrifice family life. Oh. Boy, that was a mistake. Ba, 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 am I late for the contest? <laughs> Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's hear it for them. Thank you. The Old Testament reading is from Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. 
but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm today is 119, verses 9 to 16. How can a young man keep his way pure? Let's read this together. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Blessed are you, O Lord. Teach me your statutes. With my lips I declare all the decrees of your mouth. In the way of your testimonies, I delight as much as in the riches. I will meditate on your precepts and fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes I will not forget your word. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle reading is from Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 to 10. Every high priest chosen among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, you are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he also, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him, being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the gospel. From Mark 10, verses 32 to 45. And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. And Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed, and those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over the chief priests and the scribes. And they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles. And they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days, he will rise. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came up to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit one 
at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. And Jesus said to them, you do, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup I, that I drink or be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to them, we, we are able. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be indignant at James and John. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones ex exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. I love the way kids play with their stuffies or you've, I'm sure you've seen the scene where kids get lost in a story, when their imaginations run wild, when they're off as pirates on some quest, or they're at the hospital, and we have the nurses, and the doctors, and the, the patients. Explorers going through distant lands and jungles. Or there's suddenly dinosaurs tromping around the house. 
or they're accountants. No, not really. But, you know, those kids you've got to watch out for, you know, follow those ones. Well, it's not only for kids. There's something called LARPing, L-A-R-P, LARPing. Anyone know what that means? No. It means live action role playing. And you have a confused look that you're giving me right now. This is actually something that's been going around, going on around the world, LARPing. You may be walking through a park one day and you come across a band of orcs and the men of Gondor fighting it out full in armor and makeup and everything right in Jubilee Park. Actually, there was a medieval LARPing event in Jubilee Park that I came across once. It's kind of a weird thing. You're walking around the lake and there's people with swords and, you know, and they're just living out. Um, yeah, it's like kids and their imaginations. But for adults... And, uh, <laughs> and, and it's a big deal for some people. I read about one guy, he's an IT professional during the week. In the evening, he takes welding classes so he can learn to create his own armor. So go out and, on weekends and go and, and live this out. And he loves it. He loves it. Making a story that he can just be a part of. Well, we are all LARPers. Fellow LARPers, now you're really wondering what I'm talking about. You see, all of us have a story that we participate in. The way we see our lives, there is a narrative that we fit in and it directs us. We interpret what we see based on that story. Even reality can be hitting us in the face, but we won't see it as it is because it it has to fit into our story or fit into the lenses and how I interpret what's going on in the world today. The problem is when we don't realize it, that we have a story through which we are interpreting things through. All humans seeing themselves as part of a story, a grand narrative. This is a story we tell ourselves the story we interpret our experiences through, our glasses through which we look to make sense of our lives. Not orcs fighting the people of Gondor, but maybe life is a competition and I need to win. Life is about meeting my needs and everything must serve that need. Life is about trying to measure up to others and so I'm always trying to figure out how I can, am I above or below what I am seeing? Life is about keeping others happy with me. Life is about power, control. Life is always political. It's not always negative, you know. Sometimes life, we always see it through a lens of making society better and loving others, opportunities to serve, and, and we see, you know, opportunities to love in that. These narratives drive us, motivate us, they also condemn us and can, can hold us captive. Once again, the problem is when we are blind to the story that we tell ourselves, the story that we live out, fellow LARPers, live action role players. Well, here we have the gospel lesson today. On the road to Jerusalem. Why are, on the, why are they on the road to Jerusalem? Why are they going to Jerusalem? Passover. Passover is coming up. And this is where like hundreds of thousands of people would descend upon Jerusalem. It's like Big Valley Jamboree times 10. Okay? And so that is the experience. So there's people walking to Jerusalem all over the place. And there is Jesus on the road with his disciples. It's a beautiful picture. Life on the road with Jesus. That is what we are doing. That is what discipleship looks like too. It's on the road. It's a journey. And we do it together and we experience, you know, what's around the corner, what's over the hill. We experience things together. I love it when I preach because as the president of CLBI, all of my stories are just from the Bible school and illustrations. But it's a lot of what we do over there as well. It's about discipling emerging adults, young adults. It's been that way since 1932. And we keep going. 
And we keep going. I, I, I tell people when I'm explaining the Bible school that 50% of our discipleship, I just picked that number out of the air, is in the classroom. It's the learning, getting into God's word. Uh, Tom was with us past week taking a class. We have open class every once in a while. Please come join us. Immerse yourself in God's word. Incredible teachers coming and bringing the word. Transformative. The other 50% is on the road, doing life together. Through the pandemic, we had to decide, are we going to become an online school? And we decided, no, we're not going to do that. I say that because it was four years ago on Friday that we had to send all the students home because of the pandemic. Whew, we made it through that one. So 50% of it is life together. It's an eight-month program. And over eight months, you can't fake it. Ron and Cheryl, you were dorm parents. You can't fake it. You know, for the first while, the honeymoon, things are going good, and then, woo, things start to happen. Things start to emerge. The stories that the students tell themselves and live out start to come to light. And, you know, many times there can be friction. And in those are the opportunities for Jesus to come in and love people in grace and truth, to love them and care for them and to see transformation come in a deep point. Um, this past week, I loved it. I was visiting with a student, and there was something happening in their life. And there was something said in the classroom by the instructor. And it was Jesus just bringing those worlds together, and just like, yes, this is what this is about. So, going to Jerusalem. Jesus knew what was coming. How do you think he felt? What was on his mind? This wasn't just another trip to Passover like he was when he was a child and went to Passover and got lost. Parents found him at the temple. He knew what was coming. His suffering, the cross, this was it. Fearful, anxious, trembling. But there he was, walking up ahead, leading. Like, not, you know, I would have been dragging my feet or trying to, you know, like, avoid. But Jesus is there leading. Like the rabbis leading their disciples. That's what he was doing. Leading them with boldness. This is my purpose. This is where I'm going. And uh, we read in the text that the, the 12 disciples were amazed and afraid. They were in awe, and also there was dread there too. You know, they, we fear and love God, and they, it was just a powerful, a powerful time. Then he took the 12 again. Jesus often did this. He would take the 12 aside and sit down with them and really pour into them and disciple them and teach them. This is the third time he prophesied about his passion, but this, in this one, he goes into the most detail. Delivered to the chief priests and the scribes. Sentenced to death. Delivered to the Romans. Mocked, spit upon, scourged. Executed. Resurrected. He lays it all out before them. Imagine the faces of the twelve. Horrified. Feared. Trembling. This isn't the first time. Remember what um, Jesus said to Peter? No, Lord, this can't be you. No, don't go. Get behind me, Satan. Here they are hearing these words again as they walk to Jerusalem. Things are probably starting to line up. You know, when mom or dad repeats something for the third time, it's a big deal. Well, this is, this is it. Now this sounds like a Monty Python skit. Now for something completely different in the gospel text. It doesn't say, and two weeks later... No, it just goes into this. It says, and James and John came to him, asking him... We want you to do 
for us whatever we ask. What did Jesus just say to them? He just laid it all out. The clearest he's ever laid it out. And James and John come. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, if anyone ever said that to you, how would you respond? Oh, my goodness. This is typically where my wife would say to me, you weren't listening to me, were you? And I go, sorry, can you repeat that again? Yeah. So, but Jesus says, tell me more. You know, tell me what you were wanting. He draws it out. When you are in glory, when you are in glory, grant us, yeah, grant us to sit one at your right and one at your left in your glory. What a request. Jesus said that he will rise. Glory. To restore the glory of the fallen throne of David. James and John's question reveals the story through which they interpret their lives, their experiences, through everything. It's, it's this, there's power, there's ambition, there's glory. What are the nicknames for James and John? The sons of thunder. The sons of thunder, okay? So, Jesus knew who he, who he recruited three years prior. James and John, the sons of thunder. There's a preoccupation with self. It wasn't just about to see Jesus on the throne. They wanted themselves in positions of glory. This is on full display, their failure to grasp Jesus' teaching. Yet we know where they end up. You know, I'm sure that was disheartening for Jesus to hear. It's like, you still don't get it. You still don't get it. Um, I've been the president at CLBI. This is my seventh year there. And um, it is, uh, we play the long game when we love on our students and our staff growing them, and we see them go through the ups, go through the downs, through everything. But it's great having perspective, knowing where our, our alumni end up. Um, and we see that transformation happen, and it takes time. We find the longer we have students with us, we get to see more and more growth in them. Not always, but most places, you know, we see more growth and you see going and little did I know that Pastor Josh Ma would be serving out in Cranbrook. I remember sitting down with Josh in Starbucks and talking to him about coming to Bible school and he wasn't so sure. Remember that, Pat? Yeah. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Sometimes I tell people, when people say, oh, Bible school, why would I want to go to Bible school? It won't get me my job. I'm like, it probably won't get your first job, but it'll probably get you your first promotion. You know, that character development and allowing you to be grounded in the gospel. Awakening of calling, granting of purpose, how to live out your calling and your vocation. Well, after James and John said this, Jesus called them to him. There's this beautiful gospel relationship. And this is that assertive side of Jesus as he goes and operates in grace and in truth. I love you so much that I'm going to set the record straight. He doesn't just smile and nod. Oh, that's nice. You want to sit in my left and right hand in glory? He's like, no, let's, let's talk. You want to drink my cup? The cup of wine, the cup of wrath, we read in the, through the scriptures. 
to share my baptism. You know, Jesus' baptized and John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. Why was the sinless Son of God baptized in a sin of repentance? Well, it's a picture of, of dying, a picture of taking the sin of the world upon himself and going into the tomb and then to rise again. This is what Jesus was about. This is where he was going. Their response, <laughs> we are able, you bet. Sign me up, what do I gotta do? They really wanted those seats of power. They wanted it. And they are still blind. They can't shake it or refuse it. They can't let go of this narrative, this narrative of earthly kingdom. Earthly kingdom, not a spiritual kingdom. Jesus came to make an earthly kingdom, restore Israel. And just before Jesus ascended, they still didn't get it. At this time, are you going to restore the, restore the kingdom? They just could not let go of this narrative. They had all their hopes pinned on it. Well, their family also shaped it, didn't they? Matthew chapter 20, James and John's mom. What did she say to Jesus? Say that my two sons may sit, one on your right, one on your left, when you are king. Okay? So when James and John were chosen to be disciples, I wonder who was more excited, James and John or mom and dad? <laughs> Okay, and I'm sure that when, you know, when they would go to the synagogue or whatever, my boys, my boys, they're going to do great things. And, um, but, you know, the, yeah, most people, you know, they, you know, of course, you know, the, the Romans have come in, they, you know, they're, there's occupying armies there, they want to kick them out and restore Israel. It's a, it's a, everyone wanted that. Why wouldn't they want that? We would have wanted that too. But this, Obsession with themselves being in positions of glory and sitting there and right right and left. That's just a weird thing But there's this ambition. There's something driving them Now I love in their story. It's a story of redemption James and John God redeems that ambition He redirects it It's good to have ambition, but the right ambition is not for my own glory from my own power, but ambition for others, ambition for God, ambition to do great things for God. You guys are ambitious here, Grace Lutheran. We can do this. I have visited congregations that don't have pastors and they're like lame ducks, just sitting, waiting. We can't make decisions. We can't move ahead. We can't proclaim the gospel because we don't have a pastor. And you're like, let's do this, people. The Spirit of God is among us. Anyway, I've told you that before, and I'll tell you again. I'm proud of you. Mark chapter 9, the previous chapter. They're walking on the road to Capernaum. James and John are, you know, they're discussing on the road. Who is the greatest? It's the obsession. What's the response of the others? Indignant. Angry, fed up, perhaps jealous. Jesus called to them. You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Change your narrative. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, we read in Romans 12. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever be first among you must be slave of all. Slave. Sit at your left and right hand, in, you know, seats of power. Slave of all. It doesn't get more different than that. And Jesus is saying, this needs to be the narrative. The opposite narrative. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus invited them to, to reset the narrative they were living through. And that resetting is, is 
is repentance. The Greek word for repentance is metanoia, which means to change, to transform the way they see the world themselves, God. To let go of the story, to lay it down at the cross, to let go of what their flesh wanted and craved, glory, power, prestige. And to pick up a new story, a new way of living, one of freedom, joy, and love. Jesus invites us, LARPers, we live, we live out the story, to let go of ours. It's hard to do, especially when it has been the driver of our lives. And this included the other 10 disciples. They had to let go of their view of James and John to learn to forgive, to learn to love. Resentment had built up. I imagine it got to the point, kind of like a husband and wife who aren't doing well in their marriage, who see everything their partner does as an irritant or a personal attack. Oh, I hate the way they brush their teeth. Uh, that just annoys me. And just like, whoa. You know, it's just like it's consuming, consuming. Well, the power of the cross is to lay down that story and forgive me. Let's start again. Today, we are coming to the altar to share communion, to receive the body and blood where Jesus comes in us for the forgiveness of sins, to once again say, I'm forgiven. It's a new day to be strengthened to go out and live in God's story the kingdom of God. So as you come to Jesus this morning, this is a hard question to answer. Are you willing to bring your story? The way you interpret your life and just to lay it down and say, Jesus, here it is. Now, this story might be my identity, how I see myself, whatever it is, but just lay it down and Jesus, I want to see me. I want to see myself through your eyes. I want to see others through your eyes. Spirit of God, lead me into truth. Matthew 11 says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Are you ready to come to Jesus? Can I have an amen? Amen. 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 Let us please rise and let's recite the Nicene Creed together. <clears throat> I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made for us and for our salvation, came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and in heaven into the heaven was at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. The kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, 
who with the Father and the Son is together, is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remissions of sins. I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, pour out your Holy Spirit and write your word in our hearts that we may know you as the God who forgives our iniquities and remembers our sins no more. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, your Son came not to be served, but to, be, to serve. Help us, help us not lord our authority over one another, but humbly serve one another in our homes, communities, and congregation as Christ has so humbly served us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, look with mercy in all earthly authorities. Guard them from temptation to wield earthly power improperly. Lead them to serve faithfully according to your good and gracious will. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, as your only begotten Son learned obedience through what he suffered, we pray that you would instruct, bless, and um, relieve your servants, especially Hilgrid Steele, Wayne Fraser, Albert Madigan, Ted and Margaret Matson, Erna Adam, Henry and Carolyn Simonson, Betty Lynn Vesley, Dwight and Lena Hennig, Louise Kurtz, Mark Kinn, Robert Marshall, Tom Burke and family, and the friends and family of Don Birch, and the friends and family of Bruce Ramstead, and the, and the family and friends of Gary Voss. Sustain them as they walk the way of the cross with your son, that they may know the fullness of his eternal salvation. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend for all whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we'll receive an offering. You may be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us 
and have given us your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This cup is a new covenant of my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
to see the pain on your face bearing the awesome weight of sin every bitter thought every evil deed crowning your blood-stained Oh, 
please rise. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you've refreshed us through the life-giving gift. We implore that your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Let us sing together. Go in peace, serve the incarnate Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <laughs> <laughs> almost, almost, Donna.